Hello and welcome to India Business R. I am Ashmit Kumar and here are the headlines that we're tracking this evening. Wall Street wobbles at the opening bell after yesterday's sell-off. Nvidia shares remain under pressure. Indian stock markets snap a 14-day gaining streak, tracking weak global queues. <clears throat> Government debates changes to FDI policy, which bars investments from China through the automatic route. Sources say key ministries are divided on Chinese investments. That's an exclusive. The GST Council may reduce the tax rate for some cancer drugs from 12 to 5 percent when it meets on the 9th of September. The decision could make cancer drugs manufactured by ABOT, Zydus Cadilla, Biocon, Sipla, Reliance Life and Sciences, among others, cheaper. Heavy Industries Minister H.D. Kumaraswamy bats for increasing tariff on Chinese steel imports from 7.5 to 12 percent. Promises to address challenges faced by India's steel industry. BJP MP and Jindal Steel Chairperson Naveen Jindal says even a 10 to 12 percent import duty may not be enough to stop Chinese imports. <clears throat> Government intends to discuss the rise in gold and silver imports from the United Arab Emirates. Sources say imports could increase even further, but a review of the trade deal with the UAE is not on the cards. Reliance Industries emerges as the successful bidder for battery capacity storage of 10 gigawatt hours under the PLI scheme. Said to get benefits worth over 3,600 crore rupees. 54% of IPO shares allotted were sold within the first week, excluding anchor investors. According to SEBI, banks sold 80% of such shares, reveals a study conducted on 144 IPOs from 2021 to 2023, 40% of retail investors and IPOs were from Gujarat. <clears throat> 25% of graduates from IIT Bombay did not secure campus placement this year. Average salary rises by nearly 8% to more than 23 lakh rupees per annum, but the lowest salary declines to just 4 lakh rupees per annum. India is the fastest growing beauty and personal care market in the world. A report by Nika and Red Sea expects the market to grow at 70%, hitting $34 billion in size by 2028. 21 medals and counting, Indian athletes deliver their best ever performance at the Paris Paralympics. Sachin Khilari is the latest to win a silver medal in short put. Well, let's start with a quick look at the day's market action, where a 14-day winning streak came to an end today. Sensex lost over 200 points and the Nifty lost more than 80 points, cracking weak global queues. The mid-caps and banks were also subdued in trade today. And while the stock market's under pressure across the world after yesterday's sell-off on Wall Street, today the US markets have opened with minor cuts. Nvidia shares, however, remain under pressure after a major rout yesterday when it lost nearly $300 billion in market capitalization, the worst single-day fall on record. This comes after the U.S. Justice Department summoned NVIDIA over an antitrust probe. All artificial intelligence and semiconductor or related stocks are under pressure as well. And meanwhile, crude oil prices have declined more than 6% this week. Markets are worried about high-frequency data from China, which is pointing towards weaker demand. OPEC plus nations are also considering a hike in output. Libya, a major oil producer, is set to restore production from a key oil field and resume exports. SP now expects oil prices uh, to trade around $75 per barrel this year. Well, here is a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. The union government is mulling a review of their FDI curbs on border nations, including China, after a nudge from the industry. Remember, way back in 2020, amidst strained ties with China, the Modi government had released a press note mandating prior government approval for FDI coming in from companies located in nations sharing a land border with India. Parishit Luthra now joins us with more details. Parishit, uh, what are your sources telling you? Are there different views coming in from different ministries? 
Well, let's explain our viewers what had happened in 2020 with Press Note 3. In light of the border tensions with China, uh, India had modified rules with regard to investments from countries which have a land border with India. This was to prevent uh, opportunistic takeovers. And if there is an investment, for example, from a country like uh, China and any entity there, then any FDI investment proposal or JV will have to get an approval from the government. There will be no automatic FDI or investment or JV in any sector. Having said that, uh, over the last two years, we have seen joint ventures, especially with the likes of... Uh, Suppliers of Apple, for example, being allowed JVs with Chinese companies. So on a case-by-case -case basis, the government has been giving approvals to certain joint ventures with Chinese entities. The feedback that the government is getting from certain industrial houses is that you need to amend this uh, press note 3 or this rule for Chinese investments so that we get better technology transfer, we get more FDI in the country. The CA recently in the economic survey had also said that we need to think about uh, FDI from China and it may help in India's growth as well. Uh, what the government is thinking is this. Well, there are divisions for that matter. There is one uh, group within the government, a set of ministries, a set of departments who believe that we need to allow investments of China in certain sectors via the automatic route through joint ventures where we can uh, get technology transfer, where we do not have uh, scale, where we do not have expertise and where those imports, those investments can actually help us to increase our manufacturing and export footprint. On the other, there are groups within the government and ministries which believe that national security and tensions with China are a clear issue and that's why investments from there need to be scrutinized and we need to check dumping of Chinese goods as well. So this debate within the government continues but uh, yes, there is thinking about uh, whether the Press Note 3 needs to be reviewed or not. If you think of the road that the Indian economy has to travel from middle-income uh, economy where uh, growth comes from accumulating uh, factors of production to a high-income economy where it's much more about competition, innovation, productivity, it makes sense for India to be, to be more open to investment. The countries that, are, that have benefited the most uh, initially are not necessarily the countries that will benefit the most from China plus one ultimately. What is of value to us, we should look at those things somewhat different, differently, even if they are coming from one of the neighbors with whom we might not be getting along so well, or over time the relationship has deteriorated. We have to look at it purely from our point of view, our interest, which means that we have to be able to succeed in the so-called China plus one strategy where we've had mixed results. Well, Heavy Industries Minister H.T. Kumaraswamy has said that he will try to convince the finance ministry to raise the tariff on Chinese steel imports from 7.5 to 12%. The minister said that the manner in which China was dumping steel into India has hurt the growth of Indian players. However, BJP MP and Jindal Steel Chairperson Naveen Jindal has said that even an import duty of 10 to 12% may still not be enough to stop Chinese imports. One side, rates are coming down. They are suffering, our Indian steel manufacturers. Another side, China's dumping a huge quantity. They are facing the problem. How much duty have you sought? No, no, I am not sorting. I am not requesting. Industry, they are requesting. Now it is 7.5% tax is there. That actually they are requesting finance ministry to raise it to 10 to 12%. The minister spoke about raising it for 7.5 to anywhere between 10 to 12. Will that be okay for the steel industry? Uh, that would not be that would not be enough because these prices. See, if they were uh, selling at and we put uh, say 12.5 or 15 percent duty on the price at which they're selling in the domestic uh, markets, it would be fine. But the market for they are losing. They are losing more than hundred dollar per ton. Uh, when they are exporting and which uh, which is being subsidized by their governments as per uh, the information that we have so that's an unhealthy price they're not they're not realistic prices those are just prices for dumping of their material to protect their domestic industry 
Meanwhile, India is planning to take up concerns on rising gold and silver imports with the UAE, but there will not be a review of the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or SEPA. Gold and silver imports have surged by 210% in FY24 from UAE, driven by import duty concessions granted to India, uh, to the UAE under the trade pact that came into force in May 2022. But sources involved with the India-UAE FTA say that the problem may increase with further reduction of duty, but it's not a pressing concern, a pressing problem as of now. And also Reliance Industries has been chosen as the sole successful bidder to set up advanced chemistry cell manufacturing facilities of 10 gigawatt hour capacity under the battery PLI scheme. The Ministry of Heavy Industries had received bids from seven applicants under the global tender with maximum budgetary outlay of 3,600 crore rupees. The government said that this initiative is another step towards enhancing domestic manufacturing capacity, reducing import dependence and positioning India as a global leader in battery manufacturing. Now, days after CNBC TV18 reported that the government was working on the third phase of its flagship electric vehicle scheme, the Union Minister H.T. Kumaraswamy has hinted at a likely timeline. Speaking at an event today, Kumaraswamy said that the future of the FAME 3 scheme will be clear in the next two months. FAME 3, several suggestions are coming. Because in uh, FAME 1, FAME 2, what are all the lacuna is there? For that, how to actually separate it, that lacuna? For that, we are working out. Even uh, PMO also in the in his presence, he has advising several issues. He has given some suggestion. For that, our internal ministry is working out. I think within, within one month or two months, it will be clear. Well, here's a news trigger that many industries will be watching from likely relief to the real estate sector to some cancer drugs becoming cheaper. The upcoming GST Council meeting could seek key decisions impacting a number of sectors. Timzi Jaipuria with the GST Meet Agenda. Timzi. Well, that's right. What we are learning from sources is that the GST Council is likely to get a breather for property buyers and real estate sector. Council is likely to issue clarity on three particular subjects. Sources say that the Council is likely to say that any charges paid for a preferential location along with construction service cost for a residential complex before the completion certificate is issued. In such a case, GST will be charged as a composite supply. Secondly, GST to be charged only on the construction service value and not on the value of the land while buying a residential apartment or a commercial property. Thirdly, to plug revenue leakages on commercial property renting, council is likely to suggest that commercial property let out by an unregistered person to a registered person to be taxed at 18% on reverse charge mechanism. Currently, it was being charged at 18% on forward charge mechanism. Apart from this, GST Council is likely to cut GST rates on select cancer drugs from 12% to 5% to make cancer treatment affordable in the country. Next could be on the agenda. Sources say that the Council could consider exempting GST on electricity meter services such as renting of a meter, testing charges, wire charges, etc being treating them as a composite supply. This could give a breather to both DISCOMs and consumers. Rather, the council is also understood to approve a provision that the SLP that has been filed by the government in the Supreme Court against power distribution companies on this particular matter should be withdrawn. Sources also suggest that the council is likely to give a GST relief to film distributors and producers on the past demands before October 2021 by settling them in the claims on as is where is basis now to be seen is what all the council approves when they meet next on september 9th right timzi thanks a lot for that a long list there before the gst council meeting now employees at sebi have written to the finance ministry raising concerns over toxic work culture the letter accessed by cnbc tv 18 dated august 6th stated that shouting scolding and public humiliation had become a norm during meetings. Shivani Bazaar's filed this report. A trouble for SEBI uh, Chief Madhvi Puri Butch, it seems. Sources suggest that SEBI employees have raised alarms about what they describe as a deeply toxic 
work environment under the current leadership. In a letter assessed by a CMPC TV18, said the employees claim that fear has become a primary driving force within the organization with unprofessional behavior becoming commonplace at the highest levels. Now, in a letter, employees are told that shouting, scolding, and public humiliation have become the norm in meetings, creating an atmosphere of intimidation. They also criticize the management for imposing unrealistic KRA targets and intensifying monitoring, which has led to significant increase in stress-related mental health issues among staff. Remarkably, the letter also claims that even the mental health counsellor at SEBI is said to be overburdened in number of employees seeking help. The situation has escalated to a point where even senior officials, the letter claims, are reportedly afraid to attend meetings. In response, SEBI employees are demanding the withdrawal of strict intraday attendance monitoring and calling for a more respectful and professional conduct from the senior management at the Securities and Exchange Board of India. There is also a growing call for leadership change which uh, employees are rejecting the management's portrayal of these grievances as minor, insisting that these concerns be taken seriously and adjust from these factors. Well, speaking of SEBI, more than half of the IPO shares allotted between April of 2021 and December of 2023, excluding anchor investors, were sold within a first week of listing. This according to a study by market regulator SEBI covering 144 IPOs during that period. The study also highlighted that banks sold 80% of the IPO shares within a week as well. Hormaz Fatakia is standing by with the key findings. Hormaz. You know, it's a very interesting study that SEBI has put out uh, a couple of days ago and the first biggest takeaway from that study is the fact that 54% of the IPO shares that are allotted to investors by value get sold within the first week of the stock listing itself. So that is almost half the shares allotted by value of an IPO that gets sold within the first week of listing. Now it's almost, you know that we are in, currently in an IPO frenzy of sorts and it's, a, it's an impatient frenzy of sorts because if you break it down, the individual investors sell half the shares allotted by value to them within the first week. When it comes to the HNIs, that number goes up to 53%. For retail investors, that number is around 42%. Now, when it comes to mutual funds, they hold on to those shares a little longer. So only 3.3% of those shares get sold within the first week of listing. But that number goes exponentially higher when it comes to banks because that is number is almost 80% of those shares get sold within the first week. Now, this is the interesting bit. Now, this is about individual investors. Now, 67.6% of, of those shares by value are sold by individual investors if their gains on the IPO price is more than 20% within the first week of listing. But it's not as if if there are negative returns on the IPO, the selling stops. No, the number just comes down. That number comes down to around 23.3%. But still, the shares are sold even if there are negative returns on an IPO within the first week of listing. Now, when it comes to geographic distribution, which are the number of, which are the places where the maximum number of retail shareholders, Gujarat ranks first. There are almost four out of every 10 share retail shareholders from Gujarat. Maharashtra ranks second, followed by Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh. So a very interesting study put out by SEBI. The bigger takeaway, almost half the shares allotted by value get sold within the first week of listing. Now, India's services sector activity climbed to a five-month high in August. Uh, the higher growth was largely led by resilient demand in the services sector and easing inflationary pressures. The HSBC Services Purchasing Managers Index, compiled by S&P, rose to 60.9 in August versus 60.3 in July. A reading above 50 on the index denotes expansion and anything below that, below 50, denotes contraction. And on to the latest development from the Baichu's insolvency case, the NCLT has rejected the plea of the startup's US lenders to stay the meetings of the Committee of Creditors. The tribunal noted that the Supreme Court had approved the constitution of the COC. The Bengaluru bench of the NCLT was hearing a plea from Glass Trust and other lenders challenging their exclusion of the U.S. lenders from the COC. And Air India has broken ground for its new maintenance and repair overhaul facility in Bengaluru. The airline has planned to invest over 1,400 crore rupees to set up first phase of this facility. Air India CEO Campbell Wilson said that the facility will make the airline self-reliant when it comes to fleet maintenance when the first phase is completed in 2025. Campbell Wilson also highlighted that the Air India and Vistara merger is in the final stage of moving assets and crew. 
And Bajaj Housing Finance's 6560 crore rupee IPO will open for subscription on the 9th of September. The issue will comprise a fresh issue of equity shares of up to 3560 crore rupees and an offer for sale to the tune of 3000 crore rupees by the parent company Bajaj Finance. In an exclusive conversation with CNBC TV18, Bajaj Finsav CMD Sanjeev Bajaj said that the funds will be sufficient for the next two to three years. We have the requirement to dilute 25% over uh, the next three years. And depending on how growth is going in the coming years, we'll take that call between uh, primary and OFS. Okay. So when you say couple of years, we're talking about zero to three, three to five, more than five. Right now, this capital should be for the next uh, two to three years. Um, but again, as I said, it will all depend on industry growth, our growth. So I'm not trying to project anything right now. And coming up on India Business R, 25% of the graduates from IIT Bombay did not secure a campus placement this year. More details in just a bit. And you can also catch all CNBC TV 18's news and updates on Facebook, X, Threads, Instagram and Geo Cinema. Well, time now for the international headlines of the day. Israel's military raid across West Bank entered the eighth day. At least 33 Palestinians have been killed in West Bank over the last one week. Operations continued in Gaza as well. Over 40 people died overnight as airstrikes pounded central Gaza. The United States has also announced criminal charges against Hamas top leaders for their role in planning and perpetrating the October 7th massacre in southern Israel. From one war-torn region to another, at least seven people were killed after Russian missiles struck Ukraine's leave, which so far had been considered to be a safe haven during this war. The mayor of the city said that three of the seven killed were children. Meanwhile, Ukraine's foreign minister, Kuleba, resigned as a part of cabinet reshuffle. Zelensky has said that the reshuffle will give new strength to the embattled country. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has concluded his bilateral visit in Brunei. The Prime Minister met the Sultan of Brunei and discussed ways to cement bilateral ties between the two nations. The two leaders also agreed on mutual cooperation in agriculture, industry, pharma and health sectors. This was the first visit by an Indian Prime Minister to Brunei. Prime Minister Modi landed in Singapore earlier today. He was welcomed by the Indian diaspora at the airport. During his visit, PM will meet Singapore's Prime Minister Lawrence Wong to boost bilateral ties. As Prime Minister Narendra Modi lands in Singapore, real estate firm Capital Land Investment says that it will more than double its India investment to around $12 billion by 2028. The company's funds under management in India stands at $5.66 billion as of now. Speaking to CNBC TV 18, Capital Land Management said that the company is seeing a demand for data storage in India. They added that the company plans to expand its logistics portfolio in India as well. We are now about seven and a half billion of funds under management. We are looking to double that over the next four years. So that takes us closer to the 15 billion FUM figure. This is going to be across asset classes, uh, data centers being the new one. And also we still think IT parks have a long runway of growth. So that will be the second part of it. And then of course logistics and industrial uh, also is an exciting asset class. Meanwhile, flood waters in parts of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh have started receding as heavy rains have begun subsiding across the states. State governments have stepped up their relief measures in affected areas. More than 4 lakh people were impacted by the heavy rains and flooding in Andhra Pradesh. Meanwhile, the Med Department has issued a heavy rain alert for four districts in Telangana. Now, the placement season for students at IIT Bombay, one of India's premier institutes, has concluded. Nearly 2,000 students found a job in campus placements, but 25% of the students could not find a job. And the lowest salary on offer has dropped to just 4 lakh rupees per annum. Tananjay Khatri is here with the placement report card at IIT Bombay. 
The campus placements for the year 23-24 batch at the IIT Bombay has wrapped up. 75% managed to get placed on campus, while 15% of graduates found jobs independently. According to a report published by the IIT Bombay, more than 2,400 students registered for the placement drive, but under just 2,000 students participated in the placements. Out of those, 1,475 managed to secure campus placements this year. The average salary on offer increased by nearly 8% from just under 22 lakh rupees per annum last year to 23.5 lakh rupees this year. The lowest salary on offer was 4 lakh rupees per annum. This has dropped by more than 33% from 6 lakh per annum. Last year, the pay package for 22 students surpassed 1 crore per annum. 550 students got offers more than 20 lakh per annum. 230 students received offers ranging from 16 lakh to 20 lakh per annum. 775 students were placed at multinational companies in India. 662 graduates were placed in Indian companies and 78 students bagged international offers. A total of 388 companies participated in the campus placements, which is an increase of 12% compared to 324 companies that took part in the campus placements last year. We have a detailed report on our website, cnbctv18.com, on the nature of these jobs, along with a deep dive into the companies that are taking part in the campus placements. Now, the Nika Retsia Beauty Trends Report expects India's beauty and personal care segment to reach $34 billion by 2028 from just $20 billion currently. The report pegs India as the fastest growing beauty market in the world. Highlights that rise in discretionary spends and universal access to e-commerce has fueled this growth. Speaking to Shireen Bhan at Nika Beauty Summit, Executive Director Anshit Nair said that direct-to-consumer beauty brands need to get quality and product market fit right to achieve long-term growth. You know, I think India has a crop of incredibly talented founders in the D2C space, and a lot of them are here today. Um, and they have the ability to win, uh, because India is a young market, right? There is, consumers are impressionable. Um, so I think it's really about getting the quality right and getting the product market fit right. Mm. But not just getting it right today, but mm. getting it right every single year yeah. for the next many, many decades. Yeah. And if they can do that, then scale is not an issue because then you're growing along with what mm. is a large opportunity. Well, shifting focus to Paris now, 21 medals and counting. Indian athletes have delivered their best ever performance at the Paris Paralympics. Sachin Kilari is the latest to add to India's tally with a silver in the men's F46 short put event. This follows a remarkable day for Indian para sports, which saw the country's contingent secure five podium finishes. The impressive performance included two silver medals and three bronze medals. India is now the 19th country in as far as the medal standings are concerned with three gold medals. China leads this tally with 56 first place finishes, followed by the United Kingdom with 31. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business Up. Thank you so much for watching. News and updates will continue right here on CNBC TV 18.